Hello SJD, Sacred Geometry Decoded, and welcome to part two of your series, The Great Pyramid and the Egyptian Royal Cube. But where we left off in part one was talking about John Greaves and some of his earlier ideas in regards to the pyramid and measurement systems, but uh, especially uh, which were essentially thrown away because as the rubble was removed and more accurate survey of the pyramid became available, uh, it led to well, Matthew, William Matthew Flinders Petrie is a lot of ways the father of modern Egyptology, but his survey began and, and others that came after showed that the earlier surveys of, of John Greaves was uh, not quite accurate in regards to the base of the pyramid because, there was a, well, for instance, there was a lot of rubble around there, even up until the 1960s. Uh, the uh, solar boat was still covered in rubble that was discovered around about then, but the pyramid itself, once the full base was revealed. Uh, Petri and Cole, Dorna and others were able up until the modern day to do very accurate surveys of the base. And so the Egyptian royal cubit became the accepted uh, measurement, not just because more and more cubit rods were being found, but also in the texts themselves they talk about the different units of, of measure. However, um, exactly how long the Egyptian royal cubit is is really a question of when in Egyptian history, but even once you know exactly what rough period you're in, it stays still very ever so slightly. And again, that just even just by the accepted timeline, that's from 2500 BC to up to 500 BC in the Ptolemaic period. That's a, you know there were many epochs with within there. Uh, it was not one continuous uh, growth. The, uh, for instance, the uh, the invasion of the Sea Peoples and the Hyksos and and the different, uh, you know, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom. So there were changes uh, throughout that period, but the exact length of the cubit, and uh, and I will be coming back to this because uh, Im imperial measures and the old uh, the pyramidal inch people were looking at this comparison to them. Uh, they're also they had a historical sort of trying to prove you know, essentially bi uh, biblical stories that connect them to the pyramids. Uh, however, I don't think it's, as we'll see, uh, not only the foot, but also the allegedly modern meter. So the foot itself is very old. Uh, the Salamis stone, for instance, another show that it goes back uh, over 1500 years to what the official uh, record, uh, not records, but uh, uh, the thinking goes, and that's just, it's become like an urban uh, urban myth. Um, but the pyramid, the foot, and the cubit, how they tie together. So not you know not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So with time, the foot, and geometry, and how these connect together, and can be seen not just in the Great Pyramid but others. But so geometry, the foot, the royal cubit, time, and the meter are wonderfully tied together. But uh, it's a symphony of coincidences. So as we mentioned, Piazzi, uh, Smythe, and and well, so many of uh, the astronomers, Egyptologists, antiquarians at the time were looking for these uh, connections, but they were very much based in colonial biblical thinking, and that's what they were trying to. They were more trying to prove that, rather, you know, and use the measures as a basis for that, rather than simply look at the measurement systems. And also, they didn't have Google, so it was hard. You know, it, we're so privileged to be able to do a, a search. We don't have to read even a whole book. We can just. Uh, find a chapter on keywords but we you know so i'm not putting i'm not downplaying them at all they were just at a different time also we you know we're, we're all products of the time that we live in and they didn't have google and since then we've found many archaeological records uh, to talk about time uh, units of measure and the historical origins so time, the cubit, and the meter. Now, for instance, up until the 1930s and quartz crystals, the most accurate way of measuring time was to use a pendulum. And back to Marin Mersan or Riccioli before him, they found that, that a 30-degree pendulum is the optimal one because if you extend it any further, it affects the amplitude or the time it takes. But a one-meter pendulum creates one second. So one second is based on one meter. This was historically as you know that's the origins of it uh it's it was not the survey of the earth and then dividing it up that came later the the meter and the second comes together but there are fine details in that for instance 
uh, depending on your location north or south of the equator it changes ever so slightly but as a very general accurate and reasonably accurate rule one meter within a few millimeters depending on your location north or south of the equator will create exactly a one second pendulum and this was the most accurate way up until quartz crystals but for instance now the modern meter that we use at 30 degrees is creates one second and that length of arc is one or pi over six meters which is one Egyptian royal cubit. So the cubit, the meter, and the second are very nicely connected. So this comes to, and I'll put some links in the description to uh, the Bard Code or Alan Green, he's done a Shakespearean equation, done some uh, brilliant work on the pyramids and looking at some of these issues. And uh, also the old uh, saying by uh, Protagoras is famous uh, ancient Greek man is a measure of all things in proportion in temples you'll see this happen all the time but also when we consider that you know so what exactly is an average or the perfect definition of a man now the Greeks were looking at this but people vary slightly so let's just say six foot you know which is a, a reason at least reasonably for the modern time at least accurate description and one foot plus one Egyptian royal cubit plus one meter equals 5.999 uh, feet. That's a difference of uh, one one fourth of a millimeter, so basically the width of a human hair. So that's a nice little connection there, and these connections between the foot, the cubit, the meter we're looking at. Uh, but so these cubit rods. Now I'm using cubit of Maya from the 14th century BC, just as a, just to illustrate this cubit rod. Cubits were then divided down into seven palms, and each palm was divided down into four fingers. So one cubit equals seven palm equals 28 fingers. And there you get an idea of the at least uh, basis of it. So from the tip of your finger to your elbow, depending on how tall you are, and even uh, the proportion of your forearm to your upper arm and your hand changes so slightly but as a general rule we get here this ID four fingers four fingers is one palm 28 fingers is one cubit and from the tip of the elbow to the tip of your longest finger the man is a measure of all things now using this definition uh, pi over six meters to define the the Egyptian royal cubit used in the pyramids. Well, I was just testing it myself, and uh, I'm just a few, about you know, half a centimetre short from my elbow to my tip of my longest finger. But it's all, I noticed that, I uh, never really thought about it until then, that from my wrist to my elbow is one modern foot, allegedly modern foot. Now, that brings up a nice series of uh, coincidences and, and constants. So we're talking about pi over six. Pi is a constant. And another constant is uh, Euler's number. And E minus one feet is one Egyptian royal cubit. One foot or from your elbow to your wrist. And from your elbow to your finger is a cubit. E minus one. Now, I won't go into that for the moment. But why E minus one? Well, that's something worth looking into because of the infinite series that they used. It's a bit of um, philosophical rather than you know strict methodology in regards to that. But it's... If E, it's so, so close. We're, again, splitting hairs, the difference from E minus one feet to one Egyptian royal cubit. And then it brings us back to the Egyptian royal cubit and the one second pendulum and the meter. And the foot, the cubit and the meter are coming together. So, But first, what is the exact length of the Egyptian royal cubit used at the Great Pyramid and other pyramids because at the time of Petri was when this really emerged and and um, and Petri didn't just say survey the Great Pyramid, he surveyed all of the major surviving pyramids and he um, and his surveys have been backed up by even the most modern survey to within a slight slight variation very small margin of error and when it comes to measuring anything uh, again it's so even if you for instance if you you know the stone at the bottom and you know stones aren't like razor sharp there's that little tiny soft curved edge on it so how do you do, you know that little margin of error is worth noting uh, and that's why so when, when they talk about measures they always include a margin of error because they're noting the fact that you know it's you know, to say it's exact 
is you know it's like making up an idea and saying you have proof when you're just saying an idea it's you know very well, strict definitions are important to include so since petri the survey of uh, j h cole modern surveys up to dawner in 1984 and even up to the most modern laser equipment have all shown the same thing when it comes to the pyramids and they're in feet so the you see the different uh each side of the pyramid so the eastern base is 755.8 feet the southern base the longest is 756 point um i'll use it okay 0 0.07 feet and then we have 750 the west 755.7 the north 755.4 so each side of the pyramid is slightly different and we'll be using that as an example now since the case and again just margins of error are worth mentioning now the casing stones there's only a few left on the northern side and we we would need to have these to to be as exact as we could since only a few remain surveyors have to remain on the traces left so there's these little you know marks left on the paving stones these are the, that's that layer here is the paving stones and there are traces left of where the former casing stones were so that's why they're able to talk in you know these very very small uh, accurate descriptions now all sides agree that no one side of a pyramid is exactly equal can, they can vary from 20 centimeters or eight inches you know uh, well above acceptable margins of error for older and newer equipment and as i mentioned there are traces left so they didn't sort of just guesstimate it there are sort of marks left on the paving stones to give us a very good idea of where the original casing stones were uh, again the now slight variation so the egyptian government survey down here and then this is the petri survey but you can see how all surveys are within a fractions of an inch um, uh, agree on this that no one side of the pyramid is exactly the same length and we'll be using and so this definition so you draw a hexagon with a one meter diameter it divides a circle up into six pieces pi over six and that gives us 5.23599 now i'll just occasionally just be referring to that as 0 0.5236 just to make it simpler but that's one egyptian royal cubit one sixth of a circle with a one meter diameter this is the most often referred to um, and it's often said to be exact well that's not quite true at that level you know if you're being talking about exact you mean precise and that needs to be detailed a little bit more accurately so in 1925 the archaeologists deduced that the egyptian royal cubit was 0 0.523 meters plus or minus essentially 5.236 that's one one sixth of a millimeter again that's a like a couple of the width of a couple of human hairs uh, it's often stated that the great pyramid is four so that works out to be so in general terms using this royal cubit the pyramid is 440 on each base egyptian royal cubits and 280 high this is not ex however an exact measure and that's an important uh, feature and now uh, john taylor uh, famously published a book where he detailed the 7 to 11 ratio and how constants like pi and phi or the golden number to a very very high approximate are detailed in this as a proportion of the great pyramid is 7 to 11 ratio uh, petri also surveyed the pyramid at my dorm and he found it to be 175 egyptian royal cubits high to 75 wide giving it a 7 to 11 ratio as well uh, a pyramid on this cap capstone or a, I would call it more like a salamis stone was found next to the red pyramid and it has a 7 to 11 ratio one meter high three Egyptian royal cubits wide pi over two meters and the pyramid itself 200 Egyptian royal cubits high 420 again from these older surveys uh, the height of a pyramid was determined by the slope angle left by the surviving casing stones and so for that reason we'll be focusing on the base because this is a deduction accurate deduction and then we'll be looking at the exact measures of of the pyramid and how it connects to cubits that will be for the next episode so have a good one